Time for another board game review, and this time we have the game Cloud Spire. This was sent to me by Chip Theory Games, and it's designed by Josh Carlson, Adam Carlson, and Josh Wilgus. High above the earth lies the floating realm of Ankar. Held in the sky by a powerful energy known only as the Source, the islands of Ankar have existed in peace for centuries. However, as the various factions of Ankar have used and abused the Source, the world has been thrown out of balance. The islands of Ankar, historically separate from each other, have now crashed together in an event Ankarians refer to as the Joining. Cloudspire places you in command of one of these unique factions. Assume control of your faction's fortress, heroes, minions, and defensive spires to assert your faction's dominance over Ankar. Featuring a fantastic mix of tower defense, kingdom management, and tactics, Cloudspire's asymmetrical gameplay will test your strategic thinking with thrilling competitive play along with full solo and two-player co cooperative campaigns. Ready your minions and heroes, the battle is about to begin. Let me show you how to play. So I'm gonna be straight up. This is a pretty complex game. I will maybe make a couple mistakes here and there explaining this. Uh, feel free to point them out in the comments. I actually encourage that so um, people can know. But uh, yeah, this one's a dense one, so. You'll see why in a second, why I might make some mistakes. But anyway, so in this game, uh, you are trying to attack each other's fortresses. So you advance your fortress, build spires, hire mercenary forces, and send minions and heroes barreling towards your opponents. You want to defeat your opponent's fortress gates while protecting your own, and at the end of the game, be the most powerful fortress. Or kill everybody else. Uh, this terrain here, uh, you can see these are actually mats that are uh, this is the default configuration, um, but if you don't play with the default mode, uh, you do this thing where you like flip them over and take turns like revealing them. But I'm just showing you the default map uh, for the purposes of tutorial. There are different hex types like path, planes, forest, etc. And certain units uh, can uh, go over certain types of terrain. There is a whole chart for it, um, but for example, Drang here, this little icon here with the mountain on it means they can go over mountains, forests, plains, and path. They cannot go over water, again, based on the chart here. Source wells uh, are glowing blue features all around the map. They are covered with landmarks right at the moment. These are where spires can be constructed once these landmarks are removed. Now let's take a look at a fortress itself. Here's a fortress. Um, all There are four different factions and they all look a little different. But here, you can see um, there are different upgrades you can do, uh, different spaces for uh, dice, depending on what faction you're playing, and you also track your source and your health. The fortress is also contains source wells to build spires on. <clears throat> now, the fortress gate is this frontmost hex here, um, and this is what your opponent is going to try to attack. Um, you start at 10 health. Whenever an opponent uh, attacks your fortress gate, you reduce your health by however much damage they did, um, and then you retaliate with one damage to the unit, regardless of how many hexes they are away. So um, they'll always the gate will always attack back. Fortress advancements will let you improve your fortress in certain ways. You mark those with pegs. Um, each faction comes with a very detailed list of how these work. This is the Narora. Uh, yeah, here's a whole sheet about all their fortress advancements and also all their individual units. It's that kind of game. If you want to build a level two advancement, you got to build a level one advancement first. Spires have this silver border on them, uh, and these are basically turrets that can attack uh, opposing enemies. You can only build a spire in a hex where you have influence. What influence means is if you uh, control a spire in this hex, then all the hexes uh, next to this, you have influence on. Like if I had a spire here, um, you already have influence over the one that's in front of you. But if you want to expand that word, build a spire here, and now these three adjacent hexes, you can build in uh, as well. Spires fire during the spires fire phase. They will each attack one of your opposing player's units within range. And they also have starting upgrades. So upgrades you mark with chips. This one has two attack upgrade chips and one range upgrade chip under it as on the default. Also just for general 
purposes. Um, this is how much source it is to build it. This is the reward for destroying it for your opponent. Now, every spire has a default range of one. Um, so every range upgrade just increases that. So this spire, if it was here, it can shoot up to two spaces away. Uh, and when it attacks, you roll dice. You can only have a maximum of six spires in play. Let me show you a roll. So if I, let's say there was a unit here and I attacked it, roll two dice, does one damage. There are also fortification upgrades. Uh, if you place this under a spire, um, then at least two damage must be dealt to it uh, for this to be removed instead of just one damage. Upgrade chips represent the spire's health. So as you attack a spire, um, the bottom upgrade gets removed and removed and removed. And once it loses its last upgrade, the spire is destroyed. That's why those fortification ones can be useful because if you put that on the bottom, that means they got to use two damage to take this one out before they can start chipping away, haha, <laughs> chip uh, at the others. Now let's look at a minion ship. Minions have this brown, uh, brown, bronze border. Um, and uh, they also have ones on each side because there's that many different units in this game. Uh, this is a burnout. Um, so you can see this is the health of three. Uh, it has an attack of one and a movement of two. Uh, this is the CP cost to put into play. We'll get into that later. And this is the reward you get if, uh, or they get if they defeat your burnout. There's also a keyword here, entropy. All of the units have different keywords with all different sorts of um, rules. Again, all of this stuff is explained on here. So uh, burnout, uh, entropy. If this unit's health has reduced to exactly one, it does not retaliate and defeats itself immediately, dealing two damage to all adjacent non Nororan units. It just blows itself up. Each faction has about 12 different minions you can choose from, uh, and how minions work. Uh, we'll get into how these are summoned later, but if a minion is on the board, during their phase, they have to move their full movement set. So these move basically automatically. They have to move towards the enemy fortress. So this guy has a movement of two, so he would go one, two, uh, towards the fortress. They must also always attack if they are able to do so. Uh, they can only attack once per turn. Um, we can kind of get into a little bit more of this stuff later on when we actually go through a phase. Um, but generally, these guys move on their own. They can't level up, don't get upgrades. Some of them can be promoted. We'll get into that later. You also have heroes like um, Anjib in here. So again, all the regular stats are the same, except you can see in here there are two blue dots. Those are upgrade capacities, meaning how many upgrades this hero can have. Um, uh, yeah, also terrain allowance, showing you what terrain they can go over. And this one has source aura, which means uh, after this unit's movement, it may deal one damage to all adjacent opposing spires and units. Heroes are different from uh, minions in that you only have about three of them. Uh, and these ones you can actually control uh, how they move. Minions always move forward, but these you have full control over. You can use full movement, you can move them away, you can do whatever you want with them. Uh, and they don't have to attack either. Now one thing I forgot to mention about minions and heroes, we'll get into this later, is whenever they are attacked, they always retaliate with their attack strength. Um, so if someone does damage to Burnout and it's not dead, uh, it attacks back. Now let's look into upgrades. So. You mark the health with these health chips underneath, right? So you got health chips. And then with upgrades, an attack upgrade increases their attack by one. A fortification upgrade increases their defense um, by one. By that, I mean it takes one damage to take the chip out, unlike Spires where it takes two. You know, just a little fiddly thing to forget about as you're playing it for the first time. And then range upgrades can only be added to units which have the... Uh, a number range talent. Um, so a lot of heroes uh, can't get a range upgrade. Now when a hero is defeated, it is removed from the game. And like I said, every time a hero takes damage, you remove the bottom chip, like so, until they run out of health. So let's go into a, how uh, the sequence of play works. Uh, first off, you do an event. In the first wave, you don't do an event, but let's see what an event looks like. It might say something like, shifting earth. In turn order, players must move one of their non-fortress spires to an adjacent non-path hex, if possible. Remove the bottom upgrade from each of the moved spires, then place a landmark on each newly revealed source well. So, <clears throat> events shake things up and make weird things happen. Then, 
In the income phase, everyone gains source. In different waves, you gain more source. So in the first wave, you gain what five source. Next wave is seven, then nine, then 11. Um, and to track it, like I said before, you are going to use your source chip. So five source in the first wave. Then you have the market phase. In the market phase, you can hire some mercenaries, get unique spires and equipment, or even reshape the map. At the start of each market phase, you refill the market uh, up to uh, the number of players plus one. In this case, we're doing a two player game. Um, each player can only take one turn. So uh, you can buy a market chip. Um, they, this is the source cost. Here's a makeshift wings upgrade, which costs three. It gives a unit flying. Uh, this is the stave of Anvas, gives you magic-like missile, which of course I don't remember offhand. That's why there's a rules reference book to go through every single, well, no, hold on. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, there's a whole talent sheet as well. Uh, yes, I forgot. Anyway, magic-like missile. Once per turn, before or after this unit's movement, you may spend two source to deal one damage to a unit up to three hexes away. So it's a, it's a ranged attack. Uh, you also have this guy, uh, Bar Barabrund, um, who has some good stats, also evasive. And what evasive is, is when this unit is attacked by a unit with range, to reduce the damage dealt to one. If you decide to buy one of these chips, you spend the source accordingly. Uh, and take it. Another option you have is there is a pile of earthscapes here, which you can buy for two source. Uh, this can only be purchased if no other player has purchased an earthscape, as only one of these can be purchased each wave. Um, so if you buy one of these, you can spend two source and hold on to it. After each player has a chance at the market, then it's time for building phase. In the build phase, you can take as many turns as you want until you pass. Um, there are a couple options for building. Uh, I'm going to move this fortress uh, into better view so you can kind of see uh, this stuff. So here are some options. Uh, you can build a spire. Spires, like I mentioned, uh, cost source. Like you could build this monolant, um, or I could build, build a portal. Anyway, whatever you build costs four source or however many source it costs on the chip. Place that on a source well of your choosing and uh, then it's in play. You can also upgrade a spire. Like I mentioned, um, heroes have this. Uh, spires also have upgrade options. Um, so for this monoland, if I wanted to add some upgrades, maybe make it uh, a little beefier or have better range, um, you pay the appropriate source cost. So each range and attack upgrade costs source equal to the number of upgrades the spire will have after adding it. So for your first upgrade, like an attack upgrade, it would only cost one source. But if I added a, another attack, or let's say a range upgrade to it, that would cost two. Um, however, each fortification upgrade costs two source flat. So let's say I uh, uh, beef this up, also it has two attack and fortification already. And I could put it on a source well. If you bought an earthscape, uh, you can place that earthscape on the board if you want to change the terrain. If you use an earthscape, you may immediately construct a spire on one of the earthscape source wells as long as you have influence over its hex. So let's say I decide, mm, I'll put it here. And then I could put a spire on it, but I have to pay the cost. The big thing you can do in this phase is fortress upgrades. Um, there are a lot each faction has completely different ones. I'm just gonna go show you the Narora as an example of some. Like uh, portal amplification. If you get this upgrade, you may take your turn before the first player during each market phase. Or um, naming stones. Before selecting your units each prep phase, you may spend two source to return one unit from the forgotten graves to your barracks. I forgot to mention, for this faction in particular, um, there the minions cannot be promoted uh, and uh, what happens is when they are defeated, they are placed in the forgotten graves. Most minions just go back to your barracks or get removed from the game, but these guys will go in their own special grave pile. And if you get this upgrade, then you can spend units or spend source to get them back. Um, there's also this whole uh, system with the uh, fanatic die where 
the higher the die is, if you have the observatory, the more special powers you can use. Like you can like teleport your guys and there's a whole lot to read and every faction uh, has different upgrades. Regardless, whatever upgrades you buy, uh, you mark like so. Once everyone has built spires or upgrades or whatever, then you go on to the prep phase. Uh, and in each wave, you get a certain number of command points. First wave five, then seven, then nine, then 11, and so on. Well, not so on, there's four waves. Um, and uh, you can decide which units you're going to purchase for that wave. So like I mentioned before, this yellow number here is the command points. So yeah, if you wanna get certain units, you spend those. Uh, heroes, each faction has a starting hero that costs um, no um, CP. Uh, and then yeah, there are later ones that you can buy. Um, yeah, there's also, uh, when you prep these uh, units, you can group them or ungroup them. So, for example, let's say I had these two burnouts I was gonna put into play. Um, but however, I want uh, one of them to stay in play longer. So what I could do is I could put them directly on top of each other. These have to be grouped, uh, ordered top down from lowest to highest movement stats, but these guys have the same. Um, and then uh, you place health for the top minion underneath. What'll happen is as this group moves, when this minion is defeated, then this minion appears right where they uh, left off. Or, or you can leave them ungrouped, in which, they, in which case you would pile their health separately because they're acting independently, like so. Now, then you have to decide the order of how your minions are gonna deploy and your heroes. So let's say Unvas here is my hero. I have to decide if I'm gonna place him before my minions or after my minions. Uh, let's say I decide to put him after my minions. The other player is allowed to know what minions you bought um, but they do not get to know the order in which you're deploying them. Once you are ready, you will place your minions on your fortress hex uh, to show that you are ready for the next phase. So these just sort of pile up like that. Then it's time for the onslaught phase. Once you have chosen your minions and heroes, um, each round, each player takes a full turn. So first you check to see if certain things happen. In this case, nothing would happen yet. Um, and then uh, you move. So uh, this guy is gonna move uh, one, two. Then this burnout, let's just move one, two. And um, let's have uh, this guy just move one here. Then you would check if any spires fire, but no enemies are in range. Or, or vice versa, the enemy would check to see if they had any spires. Uh, in range of your enemies. Then you can explore any landmarks that are adjacent to your units. So I can take a peek. Uh, this is Grail Vipers Relentless. Um, so certain ones force you to engage in combat, but in this case, I could decide, mm, I don't wanna reveal that, and I put it back down. Now, if I did decide to reveal it, then uh, these Grail Vipers, I would put the health underneath them, um, and uh, yeah. So that then the minions would have to attack them because they have a valid target. Now how this relentless works, let's just show you how combat would work. Normally they would just attack you with their attack stat, but since this guy's a little different, uh, he rolls a die with relentless each time. Uh, and you continue rolling the die until you roll a blank or a two. Then you deal damage equal to the total amount rolled, which is Pretty nuts, but anyway. Uh, so let's say um, this burnout decides to attack. So he attacks it for one, it loses one health. This guy would retaliate and he's gonna roll. Okay, that's one, two, three. Well, anyway, the burnout's dead. Uh, so the burnout would be destroyed. However, the, the units only retaliate the first time they're attacked. So these two could get, then attack it for one and then the hero could finish it off uh, with one attack and one attack each. These landmarks, when you defeat them, uh, you get certain rewards. So for that one, 
you would get a free relic. Relics are special items that give you like uh, effects. Like here's beginner's guide to finding your cadence. During the prep phase, you may ignore the movement set of your minions when choosing your grouping order. Some of these can also give you free spires or other rewards as well. Once your guys have attacked, then the other player would take a turn. Now, the onslaught phase ends as soon as there are no faction minions in play. So, once the last minion of either side, or actually if all the minions of both sides are dead, uh, then you resolve the defeat and then the onslaught phase is done. And then, you uh, that's the end of a wave. So ideally, as the game progresses, you'll build more units, get more improvements to your fortress, and you know, hopefully get further along the path so that you'll actually start attacking your opponent's uh, fortress with your minions. Once you start getting spire upgrades, that'll shoot down guys as they walk by, and so on and so forth. In order to win the game, um, you have to defeat your opponent's fortress gate in a two-player game. And if not, then you have to have the most powerful fortress, and how that is determined is you, cal you compare your fortress power, which is adding your fortress gate health, uh, to the number of fortress advancements you made, these little upgrades throughout the game. So making sure you up upgrade your fortress is very important as well, not only for the benefits, but because that's also gonna help you win at the end if you can't kill your enemy. Now, that's how to play. With that said, there is so much going on. This is, this is a sheet just for all the different talents uh, for landscapes and market chips. Every faction, you've got the the heirs. These guys are all about, uh, you know, you have cheap advancements and spires, uh, but they have lower health, and they're all about kind of quick strikes, and they got Elf and Kaze that can explode. Um, so yeah, the, the, the bird people, you've got the Norora, which I mentioned before. These ones are all about uh, um, a, a wide variety of minion options. Um, and you get a lot of high source gains, but also your opponent gets a lot of source if they beat your enemies. The Brawnen are all about hitting hard. Uh, they lack mo in mobility and flight, but they got strong defense and range attacks. And then the Grove Tenders. Um, these ones are about spending uh, and guarding your source. Uh, your opponents will be forced to carefully consider their attacks against your units, because uh, they got high health and low source rewards for beating them. They all play completely differently. They all have their own minions on, on the back uh, with all different abilities. So there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is improving your fortress, getting spires, getting guys, watching them go, beat each other up and uh, try to kill each other. And that's the game. So first things first, I think the game's components are truly luxurious. The chips, the mats, you know, chip theory games is all about, you know, nice presentation, using chips for everything. No expense to spare. There's a lot of care that was put into making this look and feel great to play. However, I think this game is the perfect example for me of a game where I think it's too fiddly for what feels like a kind of rudimentary experience. Now, I've never played a MOBA or League of Legends or whatever before, but I'm led to understand that this is a pretty similar experience. You got AI units, little units that go along, hero units you control, this tower defense, blah, blah, blah. This game is an absolute beast to learn uh, because there are so many keywords and also each faction's board works so differently. All the fortresses, you have to read all the fortress advancements all the minions, there are so many things to keep track of. I have such mixed emotions about it because actually upgrading the fortress was my favorite part of the game. I love being, ooh, if I do this, I can get like more source on my turns or I can shoot like a laser or I can do this. Oh, this is, you know, uh, it was overwhelming at first, but as I realized like, oh, okay, I can upgrade this and upgrade this and this helps me do this. I loved that. It's complicated, but I loved that. Once you get the hang of it, the game is somewhat manageable, except in battle, you're constantly looking things up. You literally have those whole double-sided sheets and every board as a thing. There's so many rules of, okay, if this happens, then this happens, unless there's this keyword. Oh, they're flying? Well, okay, make sure you take this into account. Drives me fucking crazy. With that said, I had a good time playing it. I did not dislike the game, but I also felt like there was a surprising amount of luck 
uh, and opportunities for just bad luck out of your control, considering how complex this game is. For example, some of the landmark tiles, they have a thing called, I think it's called Engage, where if you explore a landmark, you have to fight it, no matter what. Now, I know you have to, you know, balance the risk of is it worth exploring this in case there's one of those Engage ones. I don't know, but what's the fun of this kind of game is exploring stuff, right? But you might pull this and be like, oh, well, your minions have to attack it uh, if they're in range and they just die. Oh, your opponents just happen to stack their minions in a way that completely fucks with your entire plan for your wave? Fuck you. Now, sure, if you're a seasoned veteran, then you can start to predict because you can see, okay, they have those minions, I have these minions, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know. I personally didn't get a lot of joy of doing all this setup with upgrading all this stuff and okay, I'll take this minion and give it and I'll do this hero and I'll do this and this. And then just kind of watching them walk on a set path, like at least the minions on an automated path. I mean, I honestly would have preferred to just control the minions. I realize you'd have to change the game, you know, cause it would make it a lot longer. Uh, and I know that's not in the spirit of the MOBA genre, but I would have preferred that rather than just watching these minions I spent so much CP and whatever putting on the field and they just blindly stumble into death doing things I don't want them to do. Not my cup of tea. This game, like a game I reviewed ages ago, Mage Knight, uh, another game that I think is not bad, but it's too fiddly for me. I can see the appeal of both games. And this one's not nearly as unwelcoming as Mage Knight. If you are someone who pours all your time into Cloudspire, and you memorize all the nuances of every faction and unit, and you love this MOBA-style gameplay, which I clearly don't, there's a lot of rewarding and detailed content for you here to master. I am impressed at how different each faction is, all the different sort of cool abilities. There's a lot of cool stuff in this package. There's a lot of fun, like, ah, well, my guy does this and kills your thing, you know, that's fun. It is rewarding, and I already know for certain players out there, you don't need to hear what I have to say. You're already salivating to play this. This is already like right up your alley. However, if you're like me, and you don't find this kind of gameplay, this MOBA gameplay that engaging, or if you don't like overly fiddly games where you're like, what does this keyword mean? Hold on, but what happens if this keyword interacts with that keyword? I can't say I'd recommend it for the average player. For me, the core gameplay loop of just watching these guys come at each other, even though you can control the heroes, watching these minions just go at each other, blah, 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 they're dead. It wasn't engaging enough for me to justify all of this complexity on top of it. That's just my personal opinion. I think it's a good design, but it's just not for me. It's too fiddly, and I just don't give a shit about MOBAs, I guess.